John Book. I am. Uh, I live in Puerto Rico. I've been living here for four years now. I am a former finance professor. I am the former CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute, chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute. How many people here have read Atlas Shrugged? A few. All right, that's good. The rest of you, shame on you. You should have read Atlas Shrugged. And this is one issue Sean and I will completely agree on. Um, and uh, and I, I, I'm a partner at a hedge fund, so that's all you need to know about me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get, give it up for your arm, folks. And in this corner, we have Mr. Sean King. All right. Hi, everybody. I know many people here, but there are so, so, so many new faces. So just amazing to see the, uh, the growth. Uh, I'm Sean King. I am an uh, attorney and CPA, but primarily a entrepreneur. Serial entrepreneur, run several businesses, uh, moved here to Puerto Rico in the very, very end of 2017, so just a couple months after Maria, and have been here ever since. Absolutely love it. Um, not playing the numbers game. We're here 310 nights a year, uh, typically, or sometimes more than that. So excited to be here today and particularly excited to be having this discussion with Yaron, who is uh, somebody that I uh, greatly respect and admire and um, huge fan of, of uh, Ayn Rand and her works, uh, especially Atlas Shrugged, but there are others also. So he's right. If you've not read them, you've got to read them. got to read them. Awesome. Thank you. Let's hear, let's hear it for Sean, guys. <laughs> is David in the building? David? David, you're in the building? Where is he? Is there only one David in the building? There's only one David in the building. Wow. Well, we want, we, we, we want to thank David because he helped sponsor tonight, you know, showed it Sean King. So please, let's, let's, let's thank him for the room, <laughs> giving us a space to gather and learn about crypto, guys. You know, that's what it's all about. It's a community like uh, the, if you were, if you missed the class before, if you're new, shame on you because the class before really breaks down what's going on um, in the Bitcoin, how to how to be involved into Bitcoin, and it was very interesting. Thank you to the um, Blockchain Trade Association, Coco, Kiko, James Hat. Thank you guys for for that. That was definitely um, teaching the Puerto Rican people about crypto. Very important, guys. Very important. Thank you, guys. You know, um, all right. So tonight's debate, tonight's show is going to be a big debate about Bitcoin, money, and is, it, is Bitcoin really money? So we're going to start with uh, who wants to go first? We'll let the crowd decide. Who, who wants to hear uh, you're on first? Come on. Who wants to hear Sean first? We're going to go with Sean. He's got the better haircut. Okay, so Sean, what, what is Bitcoin? Yeah, so is, that's the first question. What is Bitcoin? What, what, I'm sorry, excuse is me. Is it money? Is Bitcoin money? All right, so this is the multi-trillion dollar question. Um, the, the short answer is at this point, I think we can say pretty confidently that Bitcoin is is money. You can argue about whether or not it's the best money. You can argue about the quality of the money at this point. But uh, I find it hard to argue, and I, I tried to steel man this argument. I find it hard to argue against Bitcoin being money. So if you read the traditional definitions of money, money has three functions, right? The first function is, um, in no particular order, store value. The second function is medium of exchange, and the third function is unit of account. I think there can be little to no question at this point that Bitcoin checks the box for store of value. Um, it may be a volatile store of value, but over any reasonable length of time, um, Bitcoin has gone up and up and up and up, right? We are, we are more than double the 2017 all-time high at this point. We the 2017 all-time high was more than double. The previous all-time high, which was more than double. The prior all-time highs, have we had some major corrections along the way? Yes, um, and we can talk about how and, and why that is. 
Also, if you look at the lows, if you go back and you just look at the low, Bitcoin's low every year. Forget the upside volatility. Just look low to low to low to low year to year. You see an extraordinarily positive uptrend in those lows. There's only been, I think, two years out of the last uh, 11 or so that uh, have been negative, and they weren't dramatically negative when measured low to low. So I think the only argument you can make that Bitcoin is not money uh, or, th or that it doesn't satisfy the store value requirement is, is just its volatility. And it is very volatile. But, and this is huge, when you plot that volatility on a graph, it is going down, 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 down consistently. And at present trend, um, if that trend holds, uh, Bitcoin will be as volatile in about the year 2035 as the uh, U.S. dollar euro pair uh, is today, uh, which is to say not all that volatile. Um, the second thing that gives me some um, comfort about the, the volatility is that it is, you know, again, almost exclusively to the upside. Um, yeah, there have been some 80 to 90 percent corrections, don't get me wrong. Um, but, but in the grand scheme of things, when you zoom out on a chart, and especially when you look at a log chart, and when you're dealing with any exponentially adopted asset or technology, especially one with network effects, I think log charts give you a, a far more relevant view than, um, than standard charts do. And when you look at a log chart, um, it's not that volatile on a log chart. Um, and so that would be my argument that we check the box for store value. The, the second sort of key attribute of or function of money is medium of exchange. I think many years ago you could argue that we couldn't check that box. Today I don't see how you can. There are thousands upon thousands of businesses that accept it as a medium of exchange. A recent survey came out showing that about a third of small businesses currently accept it in the U.S. I don't know if there's selection bias in that sample that, that, that seems slightly high to me, but uh, still a significant percentage of small businesses do accept it today. AT&T accepts it. The Dallas Mavericks accept it. Microsoft accepts it. Um, Tesla? Tesla. I mean, thousands and thousands of, of businesses across the country accept it. And when you especially factor in that you can spend it with a, with a Visa card today, uh, pretty much every business out there that accepts credit cards, um, well, at least indirectly, accept Bitcoin. So I think we check the box for medium of exchange. If, if you're going to really, uh, I think, poke a hole in Bitcoin as money, I think you probably would focus on the unit of account, right? Unit I of account means how things are denominated, the, the asset uh, in which other assets is priced and denominated. Not too many assets today, uh, even those that you can you know, pay your AT&T bill or your, buy a Tesla, they're, they're not really denominated in Bitcoin, right? They're still denominated in US dollar or fiat currency for the most part. You can pay with Bitcoin, but the price of Bitcoin that you're going to pay is going to fluctuate based on the moment by moment exchange rate with, with the dollar. So I think you can argue that we perhaps don't fully meet the unit of account at this point. But, and it's a big but, um, the fact of the matter is that Bitcoin is the single and only unit of account that is accepted and recognized by the Bitcoin blockchain network. Bitcoin is currently a trillion dollar asset. Its economy is much bigger than the economy of most, not just some, most nation states uh, that have their own fiat currencies. And so if you think of the Bitcoin blockchain as its own nation state, within that particular nation state, within that particular blockchain, it is in fact being used as a unit of account and it's being used as the only unit of account within that blockchain. So will that bleed over into the, the real world at some point? I think it's likely. I think we're probably at least a couple uh, more adoption cycles away from that. Um, 
I don't think you're going to see it really extensively used in the real world as a unit of account until um, until we're through this hyper Bitcoinization Bitcoinization phase, um, and the asset class is so big uh, and much more stable and much less volatile that you you can legitimately do that. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. You 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 can't really price it as a unit of account in the real world until it's less volatile. Um, but using it as a unit of account makes it less volatile in some ways. And so uh, we'll ultimately see how that plays out. But I guess that's, that's my argument for the moment that, uh, that we do definitely check the first two boxes. And I think if you look at it, um, uh, if you look at the blockchain itself as its own sort of nation state in a way, we, we actually do check the third box also. And, and we can, I think at this point, conceive of and characterize accurately Bitcoin as, as money. Awesome. Thank you. You're on. You're on, you're on. I'm on, yes. Um, <laughs> so let me, I'm not going to be a popular guy in this room, so I, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to, we'll start with that. You're and on, one second. Can everyone in the room hear us? Yeah, yeah. Yes, everyone can hear us clearly? Oh, bring it up in the back. Is there any way we could turn this up a little? Just oh no, turn it up. No, go okay. No. All right, you're gonna have to move closer. Is All that, right, go ahead. Go on, you are. Right. So as I said, I'm not gonna be the most popular guy in this room. Uh, that's gonna be obvious. Um, but let me let me start by saying this whole phenomenon of Bitcoin is fascinating, and what you guys are doing is fascinating. And I love the fact that it's a trillion dollar market and the money's being invested because I think whether Bitcoin is money, and I don't think it is, or not, it's going to spur some really, really interesting stuff and interesting technologies and interesting uh, ways of doing business into the future that are going to be exciting no matter what. So don't take my negativity about this particular issue as negativity about crypto more broadly or, or Bitcoin more specifically. Uh, plus, Sean knows a lot more about Bitcoin than I do. So we're starting out with there. I'm, I'm approaching this to some extent from a position of at least technical ignorance, right? Bitcoin, I don't think is money. And it's not money because it doesn't qualify for the second of the three, not the third one, but the second of the three criteria that Sean mentioned. Money is a common medium of exchange. It's money is something that people use to transact, to buy and sell stuff. Uh, you know, lots of things have been money in the past. In colonial America, tobacco was money. Gold obviously has been money. Stones have been money. All kinds of things have been money. Basically, it's a medium to eliminate all the transaction costs, all the difficulties, all the impossibilities of bartering. So we use something as an intermediary to, to get by the complexities and the, the impossibility, to some extent, of a barter economy. And money is that thing that evolves, that facilitates those transactions. It becomes the medium of exchange, a common Von Mises defined it as the commonly used medium of exchange. It's not common. I mean, it might be common in this room, but even in this room, I am going to bet that very few of you actually use Bitcoins as a common medium of exchange. Maybe you do once in a while. Maybe you do once in a while. But mostly, you use it as a, what you perceive as a store of value. Mostly, you're holding it to get appreciation from it. How many of you are actually using it as money? Almost, I mean, yes, I know a few of you are. But, <laughs> but a lot of you know, people here. No, they, uh, <laughs> most of you are still using dollars. Most of the time. And yes, it's kind of cool to use Bitcoin here and there. And there's a lot of different things that people have used over many decades as to do exchanges here and there because they were cool. They weren't money. They were cool things that people used to facilitate exchange. That's not what the definition of money is. And yes, lots of companies have 
Bitcoin on the, I have Bitcoin on my thing to donate money to you on Book Show, which you should all do. Uh, I have the possibility of giving Bitcoin, but nobody does. Almost everything's in dollars. And if they did, what would I do with it? I would s transfer. Hold convert, it. I, hope. I wouldn't. I would convert it into dollars, right? So, and that's what AT&T does. AT&T doesn't hold it. Um, and they, but they, how many people actually pay their, I know, I know some people in this room pay their AT&T bill with Bitcoin. I don't know why, if you believe it's going to go up to half a million, why would you pay your AT&T <laughs> bill with it? You would hold it and sell it when it gets to half a million dollars, right? So it's, it's not yet. Now, and this is a question, right? It's not money today. That doesn't tell you anything about where there will be money. And I think there is an argument, and I'm willing to consider an argument that says, one day it will become money. And we can have that debate, and hopefully that will be the follow-up question, right? Will it become money? Because I, I, I don't think it is today. I can imagine a world in which it becomes... I'm skeptical about that world. I don't think it will actually happen. But I can imagine it. It's certainly not today. Um, the qualities of store value and unit of account are consequence of the fact that money is the medium exchange. That's the fundamental. The other two are derivatives. But look, yeah, I mean, I can't argue with the fact that you guys have made a fortune <laughs> holding Bitcoin. <laughs> For you, it seems like a, unit, a, a store of value. And it, I can't argue with that. Y you guys are probably richer than I am as a consequence of holding the Bitcoin, at least those who didn't sell in 2013, right? Um, those who kept it. But is it going to be a store of value? And the question then is, what, why? Why is it a store of value? And in guys, that sense, excuse even me, if it is... Excuse me. Guys, can we keep it down by the bar? Maybe? A little there's, bit? There's outside. You can always go there talk outside. There is outside. outside. Yes. Thank they're, you. They're not listening to you. Um, <laughs> even if it is a store of value, then it, you could consider it an asset. It doesn't have to be then a money, right? There are lots of things we invest in and they go up that are not money. They are assets. And then the question is, where does Bitcoin get the value to be a store of value other than people wanting it to be a store of value and, and desiring it, demanding it as a store of value. And then the question is, what happens if that sentiment changes? And, you know, it, 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 you know so I, I question the store of value long term. And then the third, the unit of account is, of course, uh, of course a real problem. Uh, it's a problem because of the volatility. It's a problem because it's still true that everything, even Bitcoin, how do we measure the value of Bitcoin? If it was money, how would you measure the value of Bitcoin? If it was money, if Bitcoin was money, how would you measure the value of Bitcoin? With what it could buy. That's how you measure the value of money. With what it can buy. Bitcoin, how do you measure the value of Bitcoin today? In dollars. We all measure that. We, we watch the price of Bitcoin go up and down in dollars. Why? Because dollars is the unit of account. Dollars are the money. Bitcoin is an asset. An asset that might be overvalued, undervalued. It might be way undervalued. It might still have a lot to run. But it's an asset. It's not money. It's not how we measure what we buy stuff with. We still measure what we buy stuff with in dollars. Now, let me also say, and, and with this, I think Sean and I will agree, I would be thrilled if Bitcoin or something like it would replace the U.S. dollar if there was something that took away monetary control from the central bankers. Not, I mean, there are a few things that would make me happier. But one of the things that would make me really, really happy is to see central banks go away and money be privatized. Yeah! You, you got everybody on your side on that one. And then the question is, is Bitcoin the thing that will do it? Are other cryptos the thing that will do it? Is, I know I've got gray hair, is gold the thing that will do it? Is the dollar collapsing the thing that will do it? Will governments allow it to happen? So, but that's more a question now about can Bitcoin become money? And maybe that would be the next. I, I think that that is the next question. And the next question can is, I, um, can we follow up on that one? Oh, first? yes, please, please. Yeah, just a quick follow up on, on, on that. Um, first of all, I think it's probably used in, I know it's used in um, exchange much more than, than Iran, I think, is giving it credit for. And, and part of that may just be that he's not aware of it. But 
But when you look, for example, um, at all the transactions that are taking place on exchanges in the DeFi world, for example, which is one of the most unbelievably important and fastest growing things I've ever seen in my entire life. And I'm absolutely convinced that we are in the very, very early stages of that world. And in that DeFi world, nearly every asset is traded and priced and paired in Bitcoin in some form or fashion. Bitcoin is, as many people say, the, the reserve currency of, of the internet. So I, I hear what he's saying and I agree in the real world it doesn't have the yet the, um, the prominence as a medium of exchange that he'd like to see. But with respect, I don't think that's the definition of money. The definition of money is not that it has to be the dominant primary medium of exchange. It just has to be a medium of exchange. And this is what I meant earlier when I said we could, we could debate how good the money is at this point, how useful the money is at this point. But I don't think we could really debate too much that it is in fact being used regularly, consistently by millions of people all across the world every day as a medium of exchange and in the DeFi world and in the block as the primary medium of exchange and on the Bitcoin blockchain as the only medium of exchange. Um, so for, for what that's worth. Um, and I, I think there's a little bit of, of category error going on as my, my friend Luke Stokes likes to point out, I tend to make sometimes, or he thinks I do anyway, um, in, in the sense that Euron seems to be saying that if it's not money in, in one particular domain, that it's, it's not money in any domain. And, uh, I agree, there are domains in which it's not functioning as money currently, but I think there are domains in which it very clearly is. So I agree people are using it as money. Is it money in a sense of a common medium of exchange? I think it's not yet. It, it might become soon. I, 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 I'm skeptical, but it could become that, but it isn't yet. And it, it is in certain niche markets being used as if it was money. Although even there, I suspect that a lot of the transactions are being converted into dollars much faster than one would expect if it was real money. So what would be, um, do you think it's going to be valuable in the future? Bitcoin. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if it becomes money, it, yeah. <laughs> It'll be valuable. It'll be more valuable than it is today if it becomes money. So it, the thing about Bitcoin is the only path that I see, and again, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on this. The only path that I see for it to be valuable is to become money. That is, Bitcoin as compared to other cryptos, ha, uh, Bitcoin as compared to other cryptos doesn't have any other uses, as far as I can tell, other than becoming money. Uh, Ethereum has other uses, it, you know, and again, I'm not here plugging Ethereum, but there are other cryptos that have been devised in ways as to be useful in other ways other than as money. Bitcoin strikes me as a one-trick pony in a sense that it is either going to be money or it's not going to be valuable. So its value is going to be divided by the potential to become money or not. And so, the, so, so this question of its potential to become money becomes crucial um, it becomes crucial. And, and, and again, I, I would say money is commonly used. Common, right? People are using it, not just the crypto community, but beyond that. Um, and I think there are a number of problems with, with Bitcoin in terms of it becoming money. It faces stiff competition. Stiff competition with something we already use as money and is very easy to use as money. Um, dollar bills. The easy... Transaction costs are very, very low, much lower than Bitcoin. Uh, they're ubiquitous. Uh, there are problems with the dollar. We all know the problems, why I want to get rid of, uh, of. But most of the world out there doesn't really, doesn't really have that understanding of the deep problems that evolved uh, in, um, in dollars. And as somebody who's lived through inflation, I, I lived in an era, I, I originally was, I was born in Israel. And we, in the early 1980s, Israel had 1,000% inflation, right? And we had a currency that during a period of five, six years lost uh, four or five zeros. I can't remember. They, they dropped two once and then another two later. So you'd think this paper money was everybody would be up in arms about let's get rid of paper money. Let's go to something real. The fact is everybody adapted very quickly. Uh, transaction costs were still low. 
Um, you know, uh, uh, banks, con your salary went up really, really fast. People learned how to consume in an environment like that. It's awful, right? Don't ever live in a hyperinflationary environment. It's not fun. But it's not like there was this immediate demand for some alternative and to get rid of the government and everything. It was bad, but livable. Uh, hyperinflation would be the one thing that would, I think in America today, people would really start looking for alternatives. Again, whether it's Bitcoin in the end or not is a question, but people would look. But other than that, a dollar economy is just, and put aside the macroeconomics, a dollar economy is just on a day-to-day -day basis, just too simple, too easy, um, and it's very, very difficult to compete. It's a network effect. Billions and billions of people around the world use dollars every single day for gazillions of transactions. Um, uh, the, the Visa and MasterCard networks can do 24,000 transactions a second. A second. 24,000 transactions a second. Right. Um, so uh, it's hard for Bitcoin to gain traction. Money is a network thing, right? It's what you need a lot of people to use it for something to become a common medium of exchange. There are lots of people using dollars. There's still, relatively speaking, few people using Bitcoin. It's got a steep uphill to battle against uh, the dollar. Um, you know, there's an issue about supply of Bitcoins. Bitcoins are capped, as we all know, 21 million, uh, I think is the number, right? Um, that is problematic it, when the money supply doesn't grow with productivity. I don't think that is a long-term solution. I don't think that's ideal. Uh, I wish they hadn't created that constraint on it. it you want to be able to create a money where supply and demand match up better over time, over, over a lengthy period of time as productivity increases. The supply of money should increase as well. Um, it's expensive to transact. I know there are ways to get around the, 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 the expense of transaction. Uh, so again, technology will solve that problem, hopefully. But right now, Bitcoin is expensive. That's one of the reasons. It's expensive to do the transactions. One of the reasons it's not as used as maybe it would be otherwise. But I think the biggest issue is with Bitcoin. It has nothing to do with technology. It has nothing to do with markets. It has nothing to do with... Um, with the nature of Bitcoin and has everything to do with the fact that governments hate it and won't allow it because it takes away power from them. Any independent form of money is going to be crushed by government. It's going to be stopped. Now, I know, you know it's anonymous and the networks, it's separate and the government won't, you know, I think I, every uh, crypto person I've talked to I think, underestimates how nasty these people can be. How committed, if they are committed to destroying something, how far they are willing to go to destroy it. Uh, we've seen it just banned in China. Now, I know that didn't have a big impact on crypto. That's every other month, though. What's that? That's every other month. No, I get it, but that's part of the issue, right? Yeah. Governments are trying to figure out how to manage it. right? If you look at El Salvador, it's a really interesting. I was just reading up on it today, the El Salvador... Uh, uh, you know, using crypto. Uh, you know that when a business gets crypto and it wants to convert it to dollars, it doesn't convert it to dollars, it converts it to a stable coin issued by the Salvadorian government. So it's a way for the El Salvadorian government to control how crypto is used, how particular Bitcoin is used, and ultimately to go off of what they have as money today, which is the dollar. So it's, it's, a, it's a power grab by government, a stealth power grab by government that people don't see. Every country is trying to figure out how to regulate, how to control it, how to manipulate it. I don't think anybody's got it right. China's banned it. The price didn't go down a lot. And I, my theory on why the price doesn't go down a lot is because, in a sense, Bitcoin became more valuable when it was banned in China. Why did it become more valuable? Because I believe that a big chunk of the value of Bitcoin is to facilitate transactions, which I think dominate Bitcoin. I think the, trans the transaction type that dominates Bitcoin is transacting in illegal stuff. Now, I'm not against transacting in illegal stuff, just so we get it, right? Careful, the feds so, are, are listening. Uh, uh, that's fine. So, uh, and, uh, of course they're listening, they're listening to everything. I mean, if you think you've got privacy, you're delusional. Um, the Chinese, when the Chinese banned it, that increased the motivation of Chinese billionaires to own Bitcoin and get, use it to get their money out of China. So one of the ways to get around capital controls, this is the beauty, I think, of Bitcoin. One of the ways to get around capital controls is to use Bitcoin and to use other cryptos. And I think the, one of the reasons 
that it hasn't suffered because of China is because now there's a demand for it, which is a result of the need to use it to circumvent capital controls. <laughs> All right, that is a lot to respond <laughs> that to. That was a lot. Was about five, he got me lost. <laughs> he made about five really good points, and I want to respond to all of them, but I won't be able to remember them, so I'm counting on you guys to prompt me as, as, as we go through so I can, I can try to check them off. Number one, I think, I think Yarn is right, that money is ultimately a network effect um, thing. Um, and the rule of thumb, as tech people know, and in Silicon Valley and elsewhere is it's not that network effects are insurmountable. It's that it's that something needs to be 10 X better uh, for it to um, to surmount the or, or usurp the the incumbent technology, right? The incumbent network effect. And so you've got to ask yourself, there are we talked about the three functions of money, right? But what ultimately ends up dominating as money isn't just anything that qualifies with those three functions. Uh, there are other attributes of good money um, that really determine what ends up dominating. Money must be, of course, sufficiently scarce. Bitcoin beats gold and Bitcoin beats USD and Bitcoin beats every fiat currency at that by at least 10x, right? It must be divisible. Bitcoin is infinitely divisible with, with consensus. Um, it must be um, ideally easily secured. There is nothing out there, no asset that is easily secured, even from nation states, as Bitcoin is and as various types of cryptocurrencies are. So I could continue to go down the list of attributes of money, what makes uh, anything that, that first satisfies the three functions of money, what, what causes money to dominate, and Bitcoin is way, way ahead of everything else um, in terms of those. Now, which gives me some confidence that we can, in fact, um, overcome the U.S. dollars and other fiat currencies' network effects. With regard to network effects, um, I think it's important to remember how they work, right? When, when we were decoding or sequencing the human genome, it took a there were two projects, right? The government-run project and the private project. It took 10 years for them to sequence 1% of the genome. 10 years. And nearly everybody at that point was saying, it's going to take 100 freaking years to sequence the genome, right? There were a few very technologically astute people out there, uh, Ray Kurzweil and others, who said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Once you're at 1%, you're only seven doublings away from 100%, right? And that's the way these sort of things work. And, you know, Kurzweil predicted that within a matter of just a couple of years, we would fully sequence the human genome. And he was absolutely, absolutely right about that. Bitcoin crossed the 1% threshold a year ago or so, depending on how you measure it, we're currently at around two, two and a half percent adoption. We're closer to 20% adoption actually in the US. Worldwide, we're about 2%. At 2% adoption, you're six doublings away from 100%. And we have a decade long track record now of Bitcoin adoption doubling every eight to 12 months, consistently like clockwork. It is it is just a classical exponential network effect technology. Now, until we cross the tipping point, which is eight to 10%, there's always a risk that something else comes along and, and usurps it. I think Bitcoin has such a network effect advantage at this point that something else coming along and displacing it, usurping it is, is not likely, but still possible until we get to 10% worldwide adoption. I think we'll be at 10% worldwide adoption within the next two to three years at most. At that point, I think it's all but unstoppable and you're, you're, you're really just a, a few years away at that point from essentially saturation. Um, what were some of the other points that you're on made? The, 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 the transaction costs. Um, True, if you're settling transactions on the blockchain, there are transaction costs, and in some cases they can exceed the cost of transacting in U.S. dollars, but in many cases they're not. You see a number of examples every day where tens or hundreds of millions of dollars are transferred 
peer-to-peer -peer on the Bitcoin blockchain for transaction fees of 10 bucks, 50 bucks. I mean, tell me where else you can do that from the U.S. to wherever you want to send it to in the world. Um, so, you know, that's number one. Number two, you got to remember layer twos, right? The Lightning Network and everything involved with the Lightning Network. Um, that allows you to send unlimited amounts of Bitcoin effectively for free. And this is what's being done currently in uh, El Salvador primarily. And the El Salvadorian government is uh, exchanging that Bitcoin for a stable coin for free. The El Salvadorian government is not charging any transaction fees to, tra to, to convert Bitcoin to a stable coin for those who want to convert it. Um, and, and so I think when you count layer two, Bitcoin very, very clearly is going to be able to transact unlimited volumes of transactions, much more than the Visa network uh, per second um, at a uh, much lower cost at the end of the day. We're not there yet, to Euron's point. I'm, I'm to some degree speculating on, on where this is heading, but I don't think it requires a lot of guesswork. I think, I think we can see pretty clearly where this is going. Uh, what else? What other? What else? What other great points did you're on make? Oh, I love this one. Thank you. Government opposition. Yaron's absolutely right. Some governments will try to crush it. Um, what I think you have to remember most when it comes to this particular topic is game theory. For those who aren't familiar with game theory, game theory is the study of how people make decisions when the move that you make influences the move that somebody else is going to make. And when the move that somebody else's is going to make influences the move that you're going to make, right? So no doubt there are countries out there like China at the moment who's going to attempt to, uh, to, to ban uh, Bitcoin. And they're going to attempt to shove their, you know, uh, central bank digital currency down, uh, down the people's throat. Um, that is ultimately not going to work for China. Uh, because as long as there are some countries out there such as currently El Salvador, but soon to be a great many more, who benefit from defecting, they are going to defect. Some of those countries who benefit from defecting are quite powerful. Some of the states in the U.S. who benefit from defecting, such as Texas, are quite powerful. Um, and so when you consider the competition among states and the competition among countries and the massive advantages that are gained by not just tolerating Bitcoin, but by actively subsidizing Bitcoin, you're going to see multiple places do what Kentucky recently did, which is waive the taxes on electricity for anybody who sets up a Bitcoin mining rig and, and uses power in Kentucky uh, to, to run their mining rigs. You're going to see states actually subsidizing the adoption of Bitcoin and the mining of Bitcoin. Not every state, not all at once, but those who do are going to benefit massively and ultimately that's going to compel by economic necessity those who are resistant uh, to adopt it. To, to think otherwise is to think that some country out there could have, or a group of countries out there, could have successfully banned the internet. You know, every country that tried it ultimately got overrun, right? Um, the internet was not bannable. It was designed to not be bannable. Can you slow it down? Yes, to your own detriment. You can slow the adoption down for a while to your own detriment. But as long as other people that you can't control um, are adopting the technology and using the technology, you're going to be left in the dark ages if you don't eventually come around and adopt it yourself. Thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. You, you want to respond, it looks like you're on. Sure, just, you just want to go for it. Go. Get them. The commentary is more interesting than uh, what I have to say. <laughs> Isaac, you should just take the floor. Um, I'd say, you know, so, so let me just make a, I, I'm going to speculate here that if we're sitting here uh, in two years, we, you won't be thinking too positively about El Salvador. 
Uh, I don't think that experiment is going to go well. I, I don't think it's going to do what you guys think it's going to do. We will see, but, but I, am, I am skeptical about their motivations for doing this and, and uh, what the exit strategy is for the El Salvadorian government. This is not a ploy to bring more freedom to El Salvador. This is a ploy uh, to reduce the amount of freedom in El Salvador. But we'll see. I mean, that's still to be played out. As, it's a as ploy to be more free from the U.S. Fed. That's what it's a ploy to be free it's from. It's a ploy to get rid of the U.S. dollar as, as, a, do as a means to dollarize the economy, but not in favor of another currency that they can control. It'll ultimately bring back some form of El Salvadorian currency to back the stable coin. It's not going to end well, put it that way. I, I don't think it'll end well. Um, so... Uh, uh, I think, I think also there is a, there's generally a sense of um, underappreciating, again, the, 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 the nature and the willingness of government to... Remember, central banks, I mean, it's hard to... Um, it, it's hard to overstate how important central banks are to central planning. I mean, this is the main tool governments have to try to manipulate economies and to try to control our lives. Uh, through the supply, the control of supply of money, through the control of interest rates, through the control that they exert through a central bank, it, it gives them the ability to run, what, $20 trillion deficits. It gives them the ability to run the kind of deficits we experience today. They couldn't do that in a gold standard or Bitcoin-like world or any, any world like that. And the idea that uh, these governments are just going to fold because El Salvador is competing with them, I just don't think it's going to happen. And yes, Kentucky might do this because, you know, uh, there's a democratic uh, government right now and they want to undercut them. So who knows what motivates the particular politicians who are trying to drive a particular industry in and get jobs and tax revenue. But long term, the central government, which controls the central bank, I don't think is going to allow this to happen. Uh, how are they going to stop it? is a good question. I don't know. Um, and look, right now, there's a coalition of 130 countries. 130 countries around the world have, have signed on to this idea of having a minimum uh, corporate tax rate, right? So there's, there's been this competition of lower and lower corporate taxes uh, around the world, and uh, Ireland has a very low uh, corporate tax. Hungary has a very low corporate tax. And now 130 countries want to enforce, led by the United States of all countries, a minimal corporate tax of 15%, right? And you think that, again, the same kind of prisoners, the, the same kind of uh, game theory would prisoners work. Prisoners dilemma, right? Now, we'll see if it works. Uh, there, there, is some, there is some indication that this is going to fall apart for the reasons you just indicated. That is, some countries are going to say no, like Hungary, which is European Union. I don't know if you know, but the European Union, you, uh, you have to have unanimous agreement. Every country has to agree to any major change. Hungary, in a sense, has veto power, and their corporate tax is 9%, so they might veto this, but we'll see. Um, there is an effort to aggregate all these countries, the biggest economies in the world, and to ban corporate taxes below 15%. There could very well be an international coalition of statists, of governments, who come together to try to, to, try to find a way to not ban crypto, and even, or, or to try to ban crypto, your argument was you can't because it's anonymous and it has these amazing networks and everything. But what it would do is suppress your ability to use it as money. And that's the point, right? We're talking about can it be money. So let's say the government tomorrow said, you can transact crypto all you want, guys. You can't buy anything in the real world with it. You can deal with it with banks, and we control the banks. If you know anything about American banking, they com they're controlled by the regulators. You can buy a Tesla with it, because while we don't know what you do on your networks, we know when you buy a Tesla. That is a physical transaction that we can easily monitor. You just can't buy stuff with it. You can't use it as money. Now, what would happen in that case? It would stop being money. Now, you would argue all the transactions would move to El Salvador, to some extent. But how much stuff can you buy in El Salvador? Not that much. So, uh, and, and it's not clear that the alternative economy is going to benefit from it dramatically in a way that would force, let's say, the American government to say, okay, now you can transact in this. So I still think that you underestimate what the government can do and likely will do to the extent that you guys are successful uh, in, in launching this because you're attacking, you're full-on attacking head-on a major source of their power, a major source of their control. 
I, I certainly agree with that. Um, just a real quick follow-up on that. I, I, I don't think I'm underestimating their ruthlessness. I don't think I'm underestimating their evilness. I'm, I'm not under any delusion that El Salvador, for example, is, is pro-freedom for its people, and that's why it's adopting it. In fact, I'm counting on these guys being uh, ruthless, self-interested people, right? Um, because that's when game theory is at its best. And when you have multiple governments across the world with different interests, and not just different, but competing interests, the idea that they're all going to get together and hold a cartel together that is sufficient over the mid to long term to, uh, to adequately suppress uh, this, this new peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, internet-based technology uh, just seems un very unlikely to me. This is just a, a point at which I think Yaron and I are just going to disagree, and it's up to you guys to decide, um, you know, which which side of the sandbox you're gonna you're gonna play in. Can I, I'm, can sure, I, I'm sure we got a lot of questions in the crowd. Sure. Go, go ahead, Yaron. I don't want to well, cut I you off. I was just going to say, if governments were that rational and that self-interested in that sense, there would be very few wars in the world. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank, let's thank Sean King, Yaron Brook. All right. Now we're going to follow up with a couple of questions, but first of all, um, we had one of our, our young ladies, Coco, lose uh, an ear pod. Um, it was over. Air, Air, Apple Pro? AirPod Pro. AirPod Pro, excuse me. Oh, if anybody found it? Anybody found it? No? Thank you. Sorry, Coco. All right, guys. I know you got to have tons of questions, so let's start on this side of the room. Anybody have a question? Right here. All right. Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, maybe it says something about me that I was just attracted to the earlier discussion on monetary theory uh, as Bitcoin money. Uh, you made a reference to uh, measuring Bitcoin in USD and measuring Bit and USD in what you can buy with it, USD being kind of the default <sighs> default thing. Um, I don't think that's quite right. Uh, I, I, I think it might misconceive how uh, the relation between how assets work in general. Uh, you know, we do measure Bitcoin also against JPY, against, I don't know, any sort of asset, euro, U uh, currency, and then you measure, more importantly, USD versus other currencies. We actually do have a point of measurement for USD other than, uh, other than uh, things you buy. Uh, every asset is measured in relation to every other asset. It's just how are we determining the liquidity of that relationship and, the, uh, and tracking it on a chart. As long as we can do that, um, I don't know, <laughs> we're measuring it. And we do that for a lot of different uh, commodities, currencies, whatever. Sure. Um, so every asset can be measured against every asset, of course. But what makes money money is it becomes the unit by which all assets are measured against. So when you go into a grocery store, every, every thing in the grocery store, every product in the grocery store is measured in terms of dollars. Now, you could measure it, the tomato soup versus the bananas. You could do that. But that's the whole point of having money is to not have to do that, right? The whole point is not to have to barter, not to have to figure out how many bananas they have to give you to get the can of tomato soup, right? That's why we have money is to serve as a unit of measurement across the various types of products and assets that we have. It's still true, and I think Sean acknowledges this, the dollar is what we use to do that. Um, you know, again, as if Bitcoin becomes money, it will become the thing that when you go into a grocery store, that's how you, you know, that's the, that's the measure for every other product that's out there. Awesome. We're going to go on this end. Um, right there. The guy right there. He, listen, the Price is Right got Vanna, Vanna and I got a Chinese guy. You know what I mean? Well, I thought you were the next to talk. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks, man. Um, well, uh, so uh, 
I, I had a different point to bring up, but with what you guys are talking about, there is a place where Bitcoin is the unit of account, by the way, um, where everything, literally everything, is measured in Bitcoin, and that's called a cryptocurrency exchange. They're called BTC trading pairs. So everything, every cryptocurrency on that exchange is tradable in Bitcoin, and on many exchanges, they're not tradable in dollars. So on those exchanges, the dollar is not a currency because there is no dollar. There might be USDT, but you can say what you want about that. But, but they're all available in Bitcoin. They're mostly available in Ethereum. Sometimes they're available in, in uh, BNB or whatever. But, but, I mean, but, but that's not my main point. My main point is I think that the entire, um, that entire definition of this, this um, triune god that everyone has of, of like what money is, I don't think that's correct. I think you can pretty much sum it up with just one, which is, Money is what the government, any government in particular, collects taxes in. And that's the only, it's what? almost the only reason why it's valuable. So if, what's if you, your question? Well, in other words, if, if you think about it, if, when you have money, when you, if, you had, if you owned your own house and then you, you know, you're, you're, you're doing a trade in, in silver or gold, you know, what, here's the, it's a rhetorical question, but, you know, um, could you just trade in sil silver and gold or Bitcoin or whatever you wanted to? What, what is the one thing that's keeping you from doing that? And the thing that's keeping you from doing it, because you could barter and all those things all year long, but at the end of the year, you owe a 2% tax millage rate wise on your property that you own, where you do your homemade, you grow your crops or whatever it is that you do, you still owe the government 2%, not even, not even income tax, even if it's barter or whatever, like not even income tax, just like tax on your property you owe the government in dollars. So every year you're gonna have a yearly like flight to the dollar where everyone needs to convert 2% of the value of their house into dollars. So I think that you can really- So I get it. And so also it's not, it, it is a unit of account, but is the dollar right now, like is it really a store of value? The answer is no, it is not. Well, I, again, money doesn't have to be a store of value. Money has but it to be does. an exchange. According an exchange. to you guys. According, and it is a store according of value. to me, it doesn't. According but, to me, it's just the but, taxes. Okay, okay, I get it. But, yeah. And I agree. I don't disagree with you, right? right. I think what you're saying is a, a, a key reason why the dollar has part of the networking effect that it has. I mean, uh, the U.S. government today is about 40%, if you include state and local, it's over 40% of the U.S. economy is the U.S. government. The U.S. government uses dollars. So it, it, it taxes, I don't know what the taxes are, you know, taxes are 18 to 20 percent at the federal level, and then if you add state and local, I don't know what that adds up. So 18 to 20 percent of, uh, uh, you know, GDP is, is, is taxed, right, is, 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 uh, is taxed, and it's in dollars, right? So a big chunk of the network of it, we talked about what tilts something into, into becoming the dominant network, it's, is it 10 percent, is it 15 percent? Well. The government already has like 40%, right? And it's all denominated in dollars and it only uses dollars. It's very difficult to overcome that effect that the, the government pays for everything in dollars. It doesn't just collect taxes. It buys a huge amount, right? Government is a big, big player in the US. In the US, it's relatively small to other countries where it's even a bigger. Wouldn't you rather, if you had a printing press, wouldn't you rather buy stuff that you can from with currency that you can print rather than something that Sean is mining and in, is independent from you and yes that, so so yes so that's why I think it's very very difficult to overcome the network effect that the dollar has and, and not only that I would also develop something like the petrodollar agreement so I can drum up extra extra territorial demand from people who aren't even U.S. citizens to use U.S. Well, let's money. not get into that's, that. That's, that's not debate. That's not debate. Just, just ask the question yeah. and so, hit the mic. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Come Come on. On. Your on may agree with you, but, but I absolutely are, do not agree the, with you. But the, ta the taxes and the petrodollar, those are two ways that, like, that's what makes something. That's what makes a reserve currency. No. Second one, first no. one's what makes something money. Shut, no. Let, let, let's we have numerous historical examples of money existing without government. Lots and lots and lots of historical examples of money existing without government. So your argument that money cannot exist without government, without taxes, is just provably false. We have lots of examples of money existing without government. I didn't take it to say that. That's, what he said. That's literally what he said. No, yeah, no, I didn't say that. You did not say that in order that money is defined as that in which government taxes. What did you not say that? And nothing else can be money in that scenario. It's not that nothing else can be money. It's just that, like, that is the highest form of money. That is the most money thing that there is. 
that, that is the closest to the platonic ideal of money, money that you can get is whatever the government collects right. its taxes in. So no my, in Miami right now, you can pay your property taxes with Bitcoin. So in that case, in, in lots of other places, you're going to be able to pay your property taxes with Bitcoin or, or other cryptocurrency. So, so even if you're right, it doesn't mean that these can't be money. But wait, 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 wait. I, I, I want to challenge Sean what Sean just said. I want to, if I can ask you a question, right? When you pay your property taxes in Miami with Bitcoin, is it denominated in Bitcoin? Therefore, it's a fixed amount in Bitcoin that stays for years? No, it's no, denominated in It's dollars. denominated in dollars. So Bitcoin is just like you're using a credit. I can use a credit card to pay, but the credit card is not money. So Bitcoin is just a means to get a dollars. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna move on to the next question over this way. But I got one question: Do you own Bitcoin? No. Oh. I wish I did. <laughs> was, was it, you had the question? I no. screwed up ten there years ago. I should have owned Bitcoin. Here. All right. <laughs> but I would have sold in 2013. <laughs> That's the reality. I know that. Okay, people. Question. So first of all, I have a question to all of you: Who finds the question of what is money? One of the most fascinating questions ever. So who, who else? Me. I think many, many people in this audience, right? So the best answer to this question I was able to find of the research for the last couple of years was that money is stored labor. So this is me, time of my past generations, time of my future generations, it's you. How would you guys prefer your labor stored? As, as something that can be easily debased or something that is cryptographic and objective. Um, I'm not even referring to USD or Bitcoin per se. How would you prefer your labor to be stored? As human labor, human time and creativity is the only truly valuable thing on the planet. Everything else is a function of it. So, Who wants to take that? So I, two, two things. One, I don't think what you described as money. Um, <laughs> Uh, and if you're interested in the theory of money and credit, uh, you know, I, I, I think the best book written about this was uh, von Mises' book, The Theory of Money and Credit, that he wrote a long, long time ago, and is a masterpiece on this topic. Um, and I'd recommend reading that. I, you know, money is not a store. Money is a medium of exchange. And if you think about how money evolved, it evolved to facilitate trade. It did not evolve to store stuff. It became a store of value, but it didn't start off that way. It started off as a way to reduce the transaction cost of barter. Um, but there's another, it, 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 you brought up this objective, this, this idea of, of being objective. And that's a, an issue I have with Bitcoin that I haven't raised yet, so I might as well raise it now. And that is, what actually gives Bitcoin its value? Mm. That is, why is it worth 40000 500000 whatever? Uh, other than the fact that you guys think it's worth. That is, beyond your subjective, um, somewhat seemingly arbitrary preferences, what gives it its value? So this is a question for Sean, really. And yes, it's limited, but you can imagine other things that are limited in, in scope. Uh, it has certain characteristics that fit, but it has no tangible value. It has no use other than money. Every other money in human history with the exception of fiat money. Every other money with the exception of government fiat money has had an alternative use to it. Like gold, you could do other stuff with. Um, uh, tobacco, you could smoke. Uh, the, the rocks, you could, you could mold into sculptures or whatever. Uh, fiat money and Bitcoin seem to be the first monies that don't have an alternative use. And, and, and I'm curious in that sense, is there a difference between Bitcoin and uh, the Ethereum which you can do smart contracts with that has another use. And wouldn't that make a better money because of that than Bitcoin? Yeah, well, first of all, and I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, but um, there is an upgrade coming out, I think in November, called Taproot to, to Bitcoin that will basically facilitate smart contracts on the Bitcoin network. So Bitcoin has been a little bit uh, handicapped in that regard. It'll be interesting to see what sort of traction um, ultimately takes place in there. But uh, I think it's totally wrong. And I hear a lot of people who are very pro-Bitcoin, primarily finance and economics types, almost never uh, tech types, make the 
the error uh, by claiming that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value, that it has no use value separate and apart from from its use as as money. This is this is just not the case. Uh, Bitcoin is the most it's the largest by far and the most secure by far distributed or decentralized ledger in existence. Now, you have to think about what is the use of a decentralized ledger? Can it be used for things other than money? Absolutely, it can be used for things other than money. One just very simple example that can be used for is uncensorable speech. When Satoshi Nakamoto mined the original Genesis block, he included in there a political statement, a reference to a particular news article in a particular newspaper, um, noting that the chancellor in England was bailing out the banks in the last financial crisis and uh, objecting to that. You can log and you can register hashes of very important documents and you can log them in the Bitcoin network and prove 10 years later, 50 years later, beyond any shadow of a doubt that that document existed at that particular point in time in exactly that format. Had we had Bitcoin when Barack Obama was born and had birth certificates been registered in the blockchain, as they originally will, we would not have had the whole birther movement. So those are just two very simple, small examples. Now, layer on smart contracts and the fact that you can, you can take the entire, not the entire, but you can take large portions of the insurance industry and do away with the insurance carriers, have smart contracts running on a blockchain that actually provides effective, significant, meaningful insurance to you without the cost and the overhead of going through a central insurance company. And uh, that's, a, that's a very, very significant thing, right? So there are lots of things that you can do on a blockchain. Now, the fact of the matter is on the Bitcoin blockchain, you can't do any of those things unless you first have Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an ac a cryptographic access token that gives you access to the Bitcoin network and to the decentralized ledger that's on it. So if you wanna do any of these amazing things that I just said and many more that are just totally mind-blowingly amazing, you have to have some Bitcoin. Now, does that justify Bitcoin's current price? Probably not. There's a hell of a lot of speculation, no doubt, built into Bitcoin's current price when we're at you know 2% worldwide adoption. Uh, lots of people are forecasting much greater rates of adoption in, into the current price. But it's, it's just inaccurate, I think, to say that, um, that it has no use value separate and apart from its use as money. It, it very clearly does. So that right. was actually the most convincing case, not that you proved it, but the most interesting case I've heard for Bitcoin. <laughs>